Going forward, too, there are clear dependencies, especially in capital flows. In terms of Asian domestic demand, the largest area of growth is expected to come from infrastructure, infrastructure growth across all of Asia. For the next decade, at least 8.3 trillion US dollars especially needed for this explosion in infrastructure growth. Now, how the international financial system is going to finance this is not quite clear. According to Standard Chartered Bank, for example, multilateral agencies only provide about 40 billion US dollars a year at present, whereas the need is more like 700 billion US dollars a year. A huge amount, therefore, will have to be raised from private and public sectors. The, po the politics of international finance is one of the most fascinating and negle neglected aspects of world politics and of the rise and fall of areas and nations. And its future configuration will determine how far and how fast Asia will progress and rise. We know how Western countries dominate the international financial system, both public and private. We know about the flows from sailors to spenders in the international system, essentially from Asia to the West. We know about the flowback of this as foreign investment. If Asian domestic investment is to expand, why the long flow out and flow back? Therefore, Asia has to develop its own robust financial system, bigger Asian financial institutions to absorb Asian savings, growth of the Asian bond market, state-owned buyers of last resort to provide liquidity. For example, to get the liquidity in these markets in Asia, which may not be available unless the liquidity is provided in other markets in the developed, in the developed world, you would need a buyer of last resort. If you look at the example of the ECB in the crisis over the Eurozone, the ECB is now stands in as the buyer of last resort for sovereign bonds in the Euro issued by various countries, including by Greece. Now, that gives the confidence and the liquidity for people to subscribe to those bonds, knowing they can get out of it and sell it when they want to, with a buyer of last resort standing in there. For Asia to kickstart its system, it must have something like this to make it happen. Remember, we were left in the lurch in Asia in 1997-1998. The US turned its back on Asia in financial terms. The IMF came with a K for the Asian recovery. If you remember the picture of Kong uh, Su standing over Suharto, and that's a memory which is etched in history forever, you know. And so, what did Asia do? The Chiang Mai initiative was then put into place. It's a small one, 120 billion US dollars. And now, a new ASEAN plus three, which is what the Chiang Mai initiative is about, ASEAN and those three countries, with Japan, Korea, and China, they have formed a macro research office here, just, in, just established in Singapore, to look about how to operationalize uh, this system. It's a small step. But Asia must take bigger steps in terms of its own financial system to act so as to become a real, you know, a dominant power, a dominant region uh, in the world. Because otherwise, you don't call the shots. Who calls the shots about where money flows and how money goes back? What happened in 97, 98? How did it come in and how it went out and caused the bat to crash? So I feel there is this need still uh, to be fulfilled before Asia can uh, talk. Now it is good to talk about all these regional developments and to talk about finance and then we move into geopolitics because they become an expression of power and how they express themselves, form themselves, will be the basis of that. Whilst we are talking about greater regionalization, whether it's FTAs, whether we're talking about bilateral arrangements, how the WTO has been sitting on its bottom and not moving, and so on and so forth, 
if you look at this, uh, these two pie charts, what's happened is that the people in Asia, in the Asia Pacific, are showing the greater integration of Asia Pacific region. You notice that travel within the Asia Pacific as a whole total of travel in the world is now 55%. Our, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, sort, of, uh, sort of revenue passenger kilometer, you know, per country, yes, so one point four seven billion people have been you know, traveling. More people are traveling within the Asia Pacific, among the Asia Pacific people than ever before. Then people are traveling within the US, Europe, and so on. It's growing. And it is anticipated by 2028, 2030, it will be 61%. So people are moving within our region more, integrating with each other more, moving for business, for leisure, for whatever it may be. So this is already, already, already changing. And, and so, uh, whilst uh, we sit behind uh, you know, cross tables to negotiate and so on and so forth, things are happening. Uh, in, in one of the globali most globalized industries in the world, the airline industry, people are traveling within Asia, with each other, meeting each other. And of course, if you look at the extrapolation of, of, of the growth, of course you will see how by 2050, and this is not just uh, Goldman Sachs number, uh, uh, this is sort of a compilation, uh, we also have the World Bank numbers and so on. Uh, China uh, will be number one in the world in GDP terms by 2050. India, number two. The US, number three. And then you see how Brazil and Russia, the BRIC countries, are also, will also be coming up. Now with Japan, France, UK, and Germany, you know, push down. So in terms of economic size and GDP size, there's no doubt about it, this thing will happen. Now, what is going to be sort of the Achilles heel of this, of this development? The potential thing is that the crisis, if there's a massive, major international economic crisis which holds back the growth of all countries, this might retard. But in, in, in relative terms, the growth of Asia, rise Asia rising economies will still be greater than that of the others. And China, despite its protestations, has the financial and economic clout to develop further. I think the Chinese approach in my book is do not disturb sign saying I am busy churning my economy. And the financial and economic crisis of 08 and 09 was actually a disturbance to China. People look about it mainly in terms of what, of course, the United States, you know, the, 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 the down, downgrading, downgrading, whatever you want in the United States, but nobody has actually sort of said it is a disturbance for China. China is forced and drawn into international engagement about the future in a way it doesn't like to be engaged, to be seen. When people talk about the G2, ooh, they, 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 get, they get into a real state about it. It may become a great power, and they, they just want to just carry on with it, and they do not want to discuss their future in such big terms with the rest of the world. They just want to. Okay, some people might say it is uh, growth by stealth, uh, and, 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 and then they, they will come upon the world and, 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 and surprise it. The world will not be surprised, but it might not be more intensely interested in China's growth, as it is by the crisis, which highlighted the relative decline of the United States and therefore the relative rise of uh, China. Therefore, it's not necessarily all good for China that the crisis happened. Quite apart from its economic impact, there is this, this perception uh, impact which China doesn't want uh, to, to see happen. At the same time, there's also this, 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 this charge that China is responsible for the imbalance in the world economy, for the exports, for the undervalued currency, and for causing the world to topple over as a result of this imbalance. All our lives, when we grow up saying we should save and not spend beyond our means, but we have a global level, when some people say others spend beyond the means, the savers are blamed. Uh, and, and it is quite ironic, but uh, that's how, how it is. But so China wants quiet, 
has a word excitement about his joy. If it wants to see a regional, a regional development taking place, regional integration, it wants ASEAN to be the fulcrum of that <coughs> regional development. During the crisis, 08 or 09, it mentioned a few things to ASEAN informally through articles in the Financial Times and so on, which are not taken up by the ASEAN Secretariat in terms of currency cooperation, in terms of using a, a notional currency uh, trading uh, mechanism, uh, ASI, the ASEAN, 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 ASEAN uh, Asian dollar, as a notional uh, sort of settlement uh, in the books of trade. Uh, and so, but we know others like the Americans, Japanese, Australians come to the table in region, or region, on regional issues with other notions, not necessarily using ASEAN as the fulcrum. And then, of course, the Americans and the Australasian engagement will also determine the outline of whatever regional configuration that comes about. Japan's uh, East Asian community idea is on the table, but it's set to ignite what was called conceptual competition between China and Japan. Now, particularly the inclusion of Australia and New Zealand. Now, Kevin Rudd's, uh, of course, Ken mentioned his name, I suppose, his former prime minister, uh, 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 notion of Asia Pacific community in 2008 was much discussed in Australia, particularly. Many uh, discussions took place, A ANU, and so on. And so there seems to be a point and a counterpoint. Asana's fulcrum or coming into the region with different notions of how the community or the region should be, the architecture should be. And is this a variation on a theme? Is there a theme? I think it is important that we do not make China that feel that any proposal that is made is not intended to ring fence it. You know, we cannot treat China like Germany or the Soviet Union at the end of World War II. Remember at the end of World War II, America was the only one left standing, which it is not. In fact, it's staggering right now a little. It is weakened. Financial crisis, recession, even caused American access is valued at risk. Access, debt, President Bush and his overreach and lack of consultation, lost currency in the world, American position. Therefore, it is not America alone which is left standing to treat with China. Obama, people now say, false promise. America in imperial recession or you know, the Kishto Mahubanis and, 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 and Talib Zakarias of the world with their books on you know, uh, sort of post-American world, the, the Asian hemisphere and so on. So countless others are counting America out. It is still standing, however, but it is not a low standing. Therefore, it cannot treat China like Germany was treated at the end of the First World War, or the Second World War, and the First World War for that matter. So China is not Germany, remember. In the case of Germany, it was with us. If Germany is to be neutral and armed, who is going to keep her neutral? If Germany is to be unarmed and neutral, who is going to keep her unarmed? So it became a matter where everyone, the, the country they ever looked at closely, you have to control it. You cannot do to China what was done to Germany. And don't forget, Germany came back. It is back today despite everything. What more China with all the strength that it has now, particularly in the economy? 